Hey YouTube, it's Eric. Um, this this video today is gonna I'm gonna be highlighting this guy you see on the screen. You see this is um Felix or Father Felix A. Morlian. Uh, I think the A stands for Andrew. That was his middle name. And he was the president of uh, Pro Deo or Pro Deo, which was a Vatican intelligence agency which actually directly merged with the Office of Strategic Services at the end of World War II. There's many sources for that. Um, I'm going to link more sources than I already have in the uh, description, but for instance, the Mother Jones article, um, that will be done, I think it's called, the, no, what was, yeah, that will be done in uh, 19, it's on my archive.org page, I'll put it in the description. There's a Mother Jones article that was written on the Catholic connections to the CIA in 1984, and it mentions that uh, Morley and merged with Donovan's OSS, while the uh, William, quote, Wild Bill Donovan's OSS. Donovan himself was a knight of St. Sylvester and a knight of Malta. And you can actually see the photo of Donovan being knighted by Cardinal Francis Spellman as a knight of St. Sylvester in Douglas Waller's book, um, uh, Waller's biography on William Donovan, which is on my uh, archive.org page. It's called, like, The, the Spy Master. Um, I think that's the headline. But this Father Felix Morion is very intriguing because, you know, I found... This is in uh, I linked that this is in the blog post I linked. This is in the vast of declassified files that I found from C. D. Jackson uh, sending letters to Henry Lou Skull and Bonesman and Alan Dulles on the topic of Pro Deo. This is very interesting because I'm th this is gonna be a future video, but I found there's this quote ex Jesuit Robert Blair Kaiser working at Time magazine while uh, C. D. Jackson was at Time magazine. You see C. D. Jackson right here. And this Robert Blair Kaiser has actually uh, worked with C.D. Jackson to cover up the Kennedy assassination while working at Time, because it was it was Time magazine that actually bought up the Zapruder film. Um, yeah, that'll be a future video. But this Morlian character is very, very interesting, to say the least. Okay, um, but here's a photo of him. And I found an article from uh, Time magazine was another photo of him, but this this is like a pamphlet for Pro Deo. You see, Pro, the pamphlet says an American oriented university in the heart of Europe. And the craziest thing is Pro Deo uh, merged into another university. Uh, where's that right here? And this is the university that Pro Deo merged into called the Libera Universita Internationale de Delgi Studi Sociali Guido Carli. This university uh, was founded in that Pro Deo merged into this is known as Luis abbreviated Luis, and it was founded by Umberto Agnelli, the brother of the CIA agent Giannini, or Gianni Agnelli of Fiat, the Fiat car company. Um, and actually, speaking of that, I have a photo. This came from Lennon LaRouche, of all places, in the article titled, The Jesuits Charge That LaRouche is an Agent of the Vatican. But you see here, here's Alexander Haig with Giannini Agnelli of Fiat. Alexander Haig, Knight of Malta, Jesuit trained, U.S. Secretary of State, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. And uh, Haig had a brother, Francis Haig, S.J., who was a Jesuit priest and is uh, still alive. So, it, you know, it all connects. So th it's a really interesting photo just in this LaRouche article with uh, Gianni, Gianni Agnelli and Alexander Haig because Agnelli, Gianni Agnelli's brother, what was his name? Umberto Agnelli was uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Luis, the university that Pro Dio emerged into. You see the first president of Luis was Felix A. A. Morleon. Look, Felix Andrew Morleon was the first president. And this is a very interesting school because, for instance, like they had a TED Talk there in 2019. <laughs> uh, you should This school has a, this Luis Guido Carli school is very intriguing. They have many TED Talks there. Many uh, prominent diplomats come from the school. And it's just obviously, a good, you know, a CIA, you know, propaganda school. So <laughs> but you can see also in the news. Like they brag about how their their graduates become successful diplomats in the international scene. Pretty funny. Um, but going back to Morlin, where's the? F Give me a second. Yeah, here's so here's the photo of Felix Morlin. But I found in a book by Norman Cousins, and here's the book that I found. Norman Cousins was a journalist who's actually used as like an official dipl or a li liaison between. Uh, Washington, Moscow, and Rome. Norman Cousins was a journalist. He wrote this book here called The Improbable Triumphirate in 1972. I got this, I found this on uh, Library Genesis. It was, it was digitized by the China America Digital Academic Library, which I thought was 
kind of weird, but or interesting what they, they would digitize this. But this, there's lots of interesting information in this book, and I link this in the description. But I'm going to start here on chapter two, and you see, here, Felix Morland was like, um, you know, the, the history of the Soviet Union is very Romanized. Like the um, Felix Derezinski, a devout Roman Catholic Pole who was actually wanted to be a Jesuit priest, became the head of the infamous Soviet Cheka secret police. Um, Derezinski, the devout Catholic, would, would like brag about how much terror uh, his Cheka police would inflict on Russians. Um, you know, Joseph Stalin was openly trained by the Jesuits. That's even admitted on New World Encyclopedia. And Stalin admits to it in an interview he did with the German author Emil Ludwig. Stalin actually says that like the Jesuits like terrorized them at the seminary, which is probably why he turned into such a psychopathic monster. Um, Vladimir Lenin, openly Jewish, but uh, Lenin was, uh, he built a statue of Roman Catholic Sir Thomas More in the Soviet Union, who became the patron saint of lawyers in 1936. And um, who was, what was the name of the, there's the G Roman Catholic uh, German foreign minister during World War I who let Lenin into Russia. I think it was, oh, what was his name? I'm watching on it. Um, this is Bergen. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll come back to that. But uh, I know there was the the German foreign minister who actually like uh, you know allowed Lenin to enter Russia was a Catholic. Uh, I'm just botching on his name right now. But this is page twenty of the uh, the book here of uh, the Improbable Triumph of Norman Cousins. You see, I've a fair bit through this book. I'm just going to show you some interesting excerpts from the book on Father Morgan. You see, it just, so starting on page 20, it was it was against the background of the Pope's message on Cuba that Father Morlian informally explored with some of the Soviet delegates the possibility of further communication between Rome and Moscow in the cause of a workable peace. I'm just going to keep going next. Speaking on Felix Derezinski, the devout Roman Catholic head of the Cheka police, the Moscow Police Department actually built a statue of him in uh, 2005 out in front of the department. And uh, Rome, and the Vatican got into official diplomatic relations with Moscow in 2008. So now like, there's, there's a Russian ambassador to the Vatican and a Vatican Dencio uh, stationed in Russia. And the Russian Federal Bailiff Service and the Russian Federal Penitentiary Service, or the penitentiary system in Russia, used the Roman military fasces on their uh, seal, for instance. Um, okay, but so continue here. So, um, Morland said, so Morland, he, he, Morland said he knew how implausible this sounded given the historical incompatibility between these two groupings, but humankind was now faced with an overriding need. He, Morland, told the Russians he had reason to believe that I would be acceptable to the Vatican for the purposes of undertaking preliminary contacts between Rome and Moscow, and he asked if I would be equally acceptable to the Russians. This approach was consistent with Pope John's, and Pope John Angelo Roncalli was actually a Freemason. Uh, which is very interesting. Um, and actually, you know, I'll see if I can pull up the source, but I found a source where Father Felix Morlian actually uh, was talking to uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, Giovanni Montini, who Morlian was close with, you know, for many years. But he said, Morlian, in this uh, note to Montini, says that um, the relationship between uh, the church and Freemasonry is going to uh, improve vastly uh, over the next few years. Um, something along those lines. Um, so apparently Pope John was determined in light of the horror of the Cuban crisis, which had a little Jesuit Fidel Castro in charge in Cuba, to do what he could to, towards helping to free the world's people from the threat of a nuclear holocaust. That's baloney. But continuing, Father Morlian expressed the view to the Soviet citizens that private con contacts between the Vatican and Moscow might lead to important understandings. In particular, he more than proposed an in, that, indi, that an individual, unofficial and unattached, who is, uh, uh, who is acceptable to both parties, might initiate an exchange of ideas. So more than wanted to get unofficial relations going between the Vatican and Russia, much like how in World War II, the United States sent uh, a Episcopalian Knight of Malta, Chairman, CEO of U.S. Steel Corporation, Myron Taylor, as FDR's personal uh, representative to the Pope, but that was like a quote unofficial posting. Um, <clears throat> you see, his father Morland emphasized that he was speaking entirely as an individual. He's not. He's speaking on behalf of the CIA. And actually, you know, I found a Jesuit priest who actually admitted that 
Felix Morlin was a CIA agent. It was Jesuit Robert Graham. I'll get to that later in this. Uh, it's an Italian uh, newspaper that covered that. But Father Morlin emphasized he was speaking entirely as an individual making this proposal, but he felt individual citizens had the responsibility to undertake initiatives which might not always be feasible or possible for officials. If the initiatives worked out well, the officials could appraise the results and follow through. If the initiatives were unproductive or unworkable, they could be dropped. In any case, the leaders uh, could remain uncommitted. The Soviet delegates said they would make inquiries on all these points after they returned to Moscow and would reply by letter or cable. For several weeks after the Russians left, Father Morlin would telephone me, that's Norman Cousins, each day at the Saturday Review to find out whether word had arrived from Moscow about the project. Meanwhile, the sense of hope that had sprung up at the end of the Cuban crisis, uh, the Cuban crisis week began to fade. Specific areas of possible accord, the ban on nuclear testing, Berlin and an outer space seemed to be even more remote than before Cuba. A new downward drift seemed to be setting in. On the one day late in November, I received a telephone call from, this is the Soviet ambassador, Antoly F. Drobinin in Washington. He said the project proposed by Father Morley and at Andover had been approved and that December 14th at was suggested as a possible date for a visit by me to Premier Khrushchev in Moscow on behalf of the Vatican. So, you're saying more, so this pro deal more than is intimately involved with, you know, to, um, this is in the, this book here is a great, a great complimentary book to read to this one. If you haven't read it already is Avro Manhattan's book, the Vatican Mos Washington Moscow Alliance. You know, Felix Morlin of Pro Deal was right in the thick of the friend, the, op the opening up, uh, like the coming out in the open with the Soviets and the Vatican uh, getting into relations. Um, so this is chapter one here. I'm going to see here. Morlin is mentioned a bit in this chapter here. Okay. So Cousins gave a little, you know, a little spiel about the meeting with the Pope President and Nikita Khrushchev. Peter Khrushchev actually sent his daughter and his son to see uh, the Pope, for instance. Like, Avro covers that in his book, The Was uh, Washington Moscow uh, Vatican Alliance. But you see here a starting point. So, this is uh, Cousin Saint. And then he puts Father Felix P. Moreland, but it's A. Moreland. A starting point for the personal aspects of the story is early March 1962 when Father Felix Moreland, president of Pro Deo University in Rome, visited me in New York. We spent three hours at my office, then we went out to dinner. Father Morlin was a large, hearty man who had a gift for laughter and a genius for making people feel at ease. He, also, <laughs> he had a genius for soliciting billions of dollars from devout Catholic, uh, corrupt financemen. But continuing, it quickly became clear that Father Morlin was one of the most versatile intelligences I'd ever met. His range included an intimate knowledge of American history and institutions, world politics, modern science and technology, motion picture techniques, and European literature. He was a native of Belgium, but was equally at home in France, Italy, Germany, or the United States, the languages of which he spoke with astonishing felicity. I learned that during World War II, he, Morlian, had worked in, this is, this. I'm going to, actually, I have a source to this. This is gaslighting propaganda here. He, Morlian, had worked in the anti-Nazi underground. He had a price on his head because of his activities in harboring Jews. And, you know, I actually found a, source that Father Felix Morlian, like, a, you know, any hyper devout Catholic priest was uh, a Catholic was very anti Semitic. This came from the book, the Belgium and the Holocaust by Dan Mickman. This is on Google books. What page is this? Page 152. Okay. <laughs> you see Norman Cousins, that, like, that, that was just an outright lie that Norman Cousins just said there. Maybe it says anti-Jewish feelings not only existed among Belgian sympathizers with the quote new order concept, example members of the Rex led by devout Catholic Leo de Grel, Catholic Nazi Leo de Grel, the VN, VN, VNV and the Verdinasso, but also can be found in wider Catholic circles. Felix Morlian is an archetype, archetypal example. I repeat, Felix Morlian is an archetypal example. During the 1930s, he more than wrote a number of critical articles that referred to, quote, the Jewish domination of modern art, cinema, and the press, as well as ties between Judaism and communism. The source for that, 98, and that came from an article from Felix Morley in Ausheif Geist on Project, written in 1934. Sorry, my German was off there, but they're Dutch. I'm not sure what language that. I can't really distinguish between Dutch and German, I apologize. 
You see, Felix Morin was, you know, just a classic, classic, you know, Catholic anti-Semite. Look, look at that right there. You see, cousin saying that Morin was fighting for uh, harboring Jews is uh, <clears throat> baloney. Okay, but continuing, his his Morlian's philosophical outlook was that of a world citizen. Okay, this is interesting here. His philosophical outlook was that of a world citizen. And actually, you know, I found I'll I'll try to show you this. Uh, I have these art dark uh, archives. Felix Morlian was writing regularly to uh, Yu Thant, who is the Burmese. Uh, he was Yu Thant was Burmese, but Yu Thant was the Secretary General of the United Nations, and he was constantly writing back and forth to Father Felix Morlian. I'll try to show you some of that. To, Later in this video, I dug up a lot of information on this Morlian character. He was like a men in black behind the scenes. Um, but like, so the Morlian's philosophical outlook was that of a world citizen. Padre Morlian's universalism was reflected in the basic intellectual environment of Pro Deo University, which he founded in 1945 with the help of then Deputy Secretary of State for Ordinary Affairs, Giovanni Battista Montini, who was actually source for this is in Covert Action Information Bulletin 25, an uh, article by Peter Dale Scott. Montini was actually smuggling Nazis out of Europe, um, disguising them in uh, Dominican cloisters. <laughs> very fitting that Montini was uh, with Prodeo at the very anti-Semitic fields more than. But Montini later became Pope Paul VI. Because he had the first meeting, uh, he said that he, Morlian said, he had come to the United States for the purposes of attracting support for Pro Deo University, which formed into Luis University, which from its start had been interreligious and international, a fact he attributed in large part to the influence of Pope John Paul III and Cardinal Montini. Father Morlian spoke uh, animatedly of his hopes for the development of Pro Deo University as a training center for world citizenship. Bridging gaps not just between East and West, but within the West uh, itself. Gaps, too, between theologian and scientist, philosopher, and advocate. <laughs> the Padre, and that's an, Felix Morlian's nickname is accordingly the Padre. The Padre Morlian said he was also working on a book about Pope John. He was one of Pope John's advisors. At that time, the full force of Pope John's ideas had not broken out in the world. <laughs> okay, so I think that's good. Um, I think there's a part where... Felix Morland played a big part in the Andover meeting, which took place in Dartmouth College, New Hanover, New Hampshire, where a bunch of like Russian uh, diplomats, academic, academic, academics, writers, and scientists from the USA and Russia got together in New Hampshire. Morland played a big part in the getting these Dartmouth conferences together. So, yeah, this, he's a very interesting character. And then the book for this, I put this in the description. This is from uh, Norman Cousins' book, The Improbable Triumphant. Um, an asterisk to the history of a hopeful year, 1962-1963. So there's lots of evidence in this book that just further proof that the Cold War was, you know, a complete fabrication. Um, so I recommend you check it out. And it's a good scan, too. I got this off of uh, LibGen. Um, let's see here. Let's see, Morlian... Uh, Paul Williams mentions a bit of Morlian's activities with Russia in his book. Uh, this is the post I put together on uh, Felix Morlian and Prodeo. I put this in the uh, description. Avermaine Hatton mentions even Prodeo in the uh, his book, Murder in the Vatican. This is actually a good excerpt. I've, I think I've read this before, but I'll... Uh, I'll read this again. During World War II in July 1944, for instance, Pope Pius XII decorated General William Donovan with the Grand Cross of the Order of St. Sylvester, a reward given only to a hundred other men. Quote, who by outstanding deed championed the church, end quote. The significance of the reward was in the fact that Donovan had served as chief of the Office of Strategic Services, the wartime predecessor of the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. Early in the war in 1941, Donovan had already forged an alliance with the founder of a Catholic intelligence agency called Pro Dio. And uh, Mo Avro doesn't mention Felix Morlian, but the founder of Pro Dio is Felix Morlian. So I added that in here. Two agencies collaborated. You see, look. I'm going to repeat, the two agencies collaborated during and after the war, during and after the war, that's, just, that's important, to, to such an extent that eventually they amalgam amalgamated. This resulted in the de facto integration of the CIA and the Vatican intelligence into a global USA-Vatican apparatus, whose operations now encompass the globe. The amalgamation operated in favor of the advancement of the Catholic Church in the political fields at home and abroad, and indeed in joint USA-Vatican promotion of their respective objectives. 
It helped in the promotion of presidential candidates in the USA and in the promotion of potential papal candidates in the Vatican. Well, they got rid of John Paul I really quick. The Vatican CIA spying operations have assessed both presidents and popes during the last three decades and acted accordingly. And you can read the, if you haven't read this book, I put it on archive.org, one of Avro's books here, Murder in the Vatican. He wrote this in uh, 1985. This was the book he wrote after uh, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? And, actually, and um, I'll go to this part after, because this uh, I, I covered this. Uh, I'll read this note, actually. But uh, if you've read the preface I wrote for Do the dollar in the Vatican, you saw this uh, letter that uh, Felix Morlian sent to the e executive vice president of the Inter-American Development Bank, which is the bank for the Organization of American States, which is basically the United Nations of uh, South and Latin America. But Morlian had a program in place here. Well, like... Uh, um, Grayton Upton wrote to Walter Rostow with the heading saying, Father Morlian and program of Catholic Church for indoctrination of Latin American priests and divulgation of principles of U.S. free enterprise system. So I'll read some of that after, but that's a very interesting note. <laughs> um, and it, right after, two years after this note came out, uh, was written, a uh, Jesuit educated former president of Ecuador in the 50s, Gallo Plaza, became the secretary general of the Organization of American States, which, uh, which is the parent organization of the uh, Inter-American Development Bank. <laughs> and you see Gallo Plaza went to Georgetown University and was a lawyer for the United Fruit Company, so it was perfect. Okay, but this was what, uh, and this isn't all of the mentions in uh, Paul Williams' book, uh, Operation Gladio, but he mentions more than quite a bit. Okay, and uh, see, your father, Felix Morlian, a Belgian priest, was affiliated with the Hyperon Language School and served to establish a branch of the school in Rome. During World War II, he had worked closely with Wild Bill Donovan and the Office of Strategic Services by creating ProDio, a Catholic intelligence agency. When the Nazis seized control of Western Europe, Donovan relocated Morlian and his agency from Lisbon to New York. In 1945, the priest relocated to Rome, where he became a private emissary of Pope Pius XII and four of the Pope's successors. Four successors. Morlian died in 1987, and he's buried in Westchester County in New York. I thought was interesting. But throughout the 1960s, he remained a pivotal U.S. intelligence agent, a pivotal U.S. intelligence agent, as witnessed by his key role in the Cuban Missile Crisis. At JFK's urging, the Dominican priest Morlian had attended a strategic meeting in Andover, Massachusetts, which I showed you in the Cousins book, where he established a communication channel between Moscow and Washington, mediated by Pope John the 23rd through whom messages were passed that brought an end to the threat of nuclear war. Um, there was no threat of nuclear war to begin with. You know, it was all just a Jesuit, diabolical, Hegelian um, hoax. That was what the Cold War was. Continuing, in 1966, Morlin established with funding from the CIA the pro Deal University, which became the Liberia Universitale Internationale Degli Studi Sociali, uh, abbreviated LUIS, the International University of Social Studies, that's the, the English um, abbreviate, or English name. As president of the new university, Marlin became a force in the formation of right-wing policies of the Italian government. He also reportedly began recruiting of uh, terrorists and assassins, including Moriarty and Mohammed Ali Adga. And this is actually, I'll show you, because Adga was the guy who supposedly tried to um, shoot John Paul uh, II. And it's crazy because um, this was mentioned in the covert... This is where I first saw this in uh, covert operation or covert action bulletin 25. I mentioned this earlier in the video, but you should check out because this uh, this blog or, or this this blog this isn't a blog. This is like a journal. This journal and this issue um, quoted this Romanian temple journal, which said that Morlin uh, was spying for the Jesuit espionage network. But uh, right at the bottom, it says here, Morlian emerged as a key figure in the Bulgarian Connection hoax. Because the Bulgarian Connection hoax was all about tying uh, Adga to uh, Bulgaria because this Antonov guy that was close to them. So they, bl they blamed this uh, uh, attempted hit on the Pope on the communists in Bulgaria and Russia, which was just you know, a smokescreen. But um, Morlian emerged as a key figure in the Bulgarian Connection hoax when the fascist Grey Wolf Adga... Grey Wolves was a CIA... Um, group in uh, Turkey, a CIA terrorist-funded group. But when fascist werewolf Adga attempted to assassinate the Pope, it appears that Morleon lived in Rome directly below the apartment of the Bulgarian Antonov and was a possible source of Adga's description of Antonov's apartment. 
And this this uh, this accusation comes up quite a bit. And here's the source from I mentioned of the Jesuit Robert Graham. S.J. confirms that Father Felix Morlin was a CIA agent. He was quoted in an Italian article, La Repubblica, titled The Pious Friar Working for the CIA. Quote, quote from the Jesuit Father Robert Graham. If you'll highlight this. Yes, Father Felix Morlin was from the CIA. He was a big point of reference for American intelligence. The Italian uh, Republica continues, This was declared by Jesuit Father Robert Graham, one of the most qualified espionage history scholars. Father Graham added that Morlian, who died two years ago, was called, quote, uh, called CIP, CIP, uh, meaning, quote, Pro Deal Information Center. A spokesman for the CIA, Marks Manfield, said instead that, I have not read the statements of the Italian Prime Minister. However, I repeat that it is not that we confirm or deny the fact that Morlian was our agent or the words of Andretti or not. We simply do not comment. Uh, continuing from the... The article, the Prime Minister claims that Adga was able to describe, and that's Andretti, the, Andretti, the Prime Minister Andretti claims that Mohamed Adga was able to describe Antonov's apartment despite never setting foot in it, as it turned out to the trial. Therefore, someone suggested to him that how the house was made, but the queue contained an error, the existence of a sliding door, a detail instead that was found only in the apartment below where Father Morlian lived. So like Morlin, you know, he came. He was a big part in this uh, Bulgarian connection hoax. Like a you know huge player in it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and Paul Williams mentions here. Uh, Paul Williams mentions another problem came from Adga's description of Antonov's apartment. The distinct features he described, including an ordinate room divider between the living and dining areas, were not found in the Bulgarians' living quarters. They were unique to the flat one four below, which was occupied by Father Morlin. Okay. And actually, in few, uh, Paul Williams claims Morlin was a member of the uh, Knights of Malta. And this guy here was, I'm just going to show you this guy here, if you haven't mentioned him. I don't think I've mentioned this guy on my channel. Count Alexandre de Marchet, Marenches. This guy was head of the French Secret Service, who was also an advisor to Ronald Reagan. Like, how, what? You can That's on his Wikipedia page. Look. He's this, quote, special advisor to Ronald Reagan. He was a former director of the French Secrets, uh, French Intelligence, the Service de Documentation Exterieure et Contre Espionage, S-D-E-C-E. -E. Like, what's this Knight of Malta, head of French intelligence, doing as a private advisor, uh, yeah, special advisor to Reagan? And you see a photo of him in the White House. <laughs> this guy's a Knight of Malta, French aristocrat. <laughs> Look, he was an aide, he literally, look, he came from a family, an aide to camp, to literally a late Jesuit Marshal Ferdinand Folk and to the fascist Catholic Nazi, Philip Pettin, who was in charge of uh, Vichy, France. Like, <laughs> it's right in your face. Let me see if this the Wikipedia even mentioned. Yeah, he's mentioned as a Knight of Malta down here. Yeah, you know, this is just a crazy connection. This guy was literally like, there's a photo of him in the White House with Reagan. What's a French? <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> okay, but you see here, Marenches was also a member of the SMOM along with CIA Director William Casey, Secretary of State Alexander Haig. I showed you the picture of Haig with Agnelli uh, earlier in the video. Like, Agnelli is one of the founders of Luis, the university that uh, ProDio merged into. Morlin was the first president of Luis. Uh, Secretary of the Treasury, William Simon, was also a Knight of Malta. U.S. Ambassador to the Vatican, William Wilson, was a Knight of Malta. Luicio Gelli, the head of P2 Masonry, is a Knight of Malta. Father Felix Morlian, a Knight of Malta. And General Santavio of SISMI, that's Italian intelligence. Now, she's speaking of, so this is interesting. So, Paul Williams says that Gelli is a, was a Knight of Malta with Morlian. I'm going to link this. I found this article from... The Italian insider IT called Calvi Wrapped in Cold War Intelligence Web. And Morlin was, this is a crazy entry on Morlin here. Um, and he talked here about, uh, first is the Morlin's connection to C.D. Jackson. After the war, C.D. Jackson became vice president of Time, Inc. and president of the National Committee for Free Europe, which was funded by the CIA and controlled Radio Free Europe. He also threw his weight behind another effective Cold War instrument, the pro Deo movement, founded by a remarkable Dominican priest from Belgium, Father Felix Morlin. Morlin's propaganda and espionage empire was set up in Brussels before the war and went on to include the Pro Deo University in Rome, now known as Luis, 
Funded by the CIA and by Fiat President Vittorio Valletta and other Bilderberger, Morleon's, quote, journalistic establishment provided U.S. intelligence with information on the Vatican and from a worldwide network of correspondents. Um, Father Morleon cut out his teeth in espionage in the propaganda business in pre-war Belgium, where his Catholic press center campaigned against moral decadence in the cinema and communist infiltration of Belgian industry. He reportedly entered into contact with Britain's secret intelligence service, MI6, at this time. That's very interesting. The, there's the Jesuit priest, uh, Father Andrew Morrison, that was at Jonestown, who was also uh, or in Guyana, near Jonestown, uh, in Georgetown, Guyana, who was an uh, MI6 agent as well. The Jesuit Father Andrew Morrison, SJ. But continuing, the British were keen on his, Morland's anti-communism, but even more interested in his contacts with Catholic dissidents in Nazi-ruled Germany. And this, there's a connection here to Luisio Gelli. That's why I brought up the source. Morleans' intelligence gathering and anti-communist agitation continued during and after the war under American auspices. U.S. spy chief Bill Donovan helped him escape from Belgium to Portugal in 1940 and then to greater safety in New York, ultimately financing his move to Italy in 1944. The Dominican priest, and here's a connection to Gelli. This is fascinating. The Dominican priest's anti-communist activities made him a natural ally for Luisio Gelli, the head of P2 Freemasonry and Roberto Calvi's P2 organization. In a self-praising book entitled Luisio Gelli, European Poet, Gelli published a diploma written in Latin confirming his receipt for an honorary degree in financial science from the International Pro Deo University of New York in October 1995. <laughs> I'm just going to re re-highlight that accusation. You see, in Paul Williams' book, like uh, Jelly is listed right after Felix Morlean as a, a Knight of Malta. So, you know, it makes sense. Um, so where is the. Okay. And I'm speaking of this, I'm going to pull up the source from this Paul Williams book. I put this on my archive.org page. You can get this through the Morlean post I put together. But uh, I'm going to show you the source for Morlean speaking to. Uh, Pope, I've already shown you in this video that Morlean was very close with uh, Giovanni Montini. Very, very close. But this source claims that Morlean was writing to Montini about Freemasonry in the Catholic Church getting closer. This came from Mambalti WordPress. And this, the title of this article is Letter Written by Father Luigi Villa to All Cardinals Regarding Pope Paul VI and Who Was Appointed to Uncover Freemasonry. That was the title. This is under a headline here, Paul VI, a Freemason. Um, she says, Monsignor Montini said to Felix A. Morlean, quote, a generation would not uh, even pass before peace would be made between the two societies, church and Freemasonry. Very interesting. And then, you know, and so you know, supposedly uh, Morlean, you know, was very close with Lucio Gelli as well. So, you know, this all ties in of P2. Um, you know, makes you think the P2 scandal probably went over into Russia as well, because Morlean was advocating for diplomatic relations between the U.S., the Vatican, and Russia as well. You see, in, in March 1965, Pope Paul received an audience with leaders of the Rotary Club, and this website says a Masonic organization. Um, so, that, you know, this this uh, this website claims that Paul VI was a Freemason, but this is a really interesting source with Felix Morlean saying to Paul VI that a generation would not even pass before peace would be made between the two societies. Uh, being the church and uh, Freemasonry. Very interesting stuff. Um, and actually, you know what? I, now that I have this, I found a Time Magazine article on Felix Morlean. I linked that in the description. I put this together with the snipping tool, but this was called For Money Ma for Managers and Molders. I'll just read this quick. Because there's a, there's some interesting connections at the end, like the U.S. the big U.S. economist Peter Drucker, who is actually credited for like forming the current uh, one of the biggest uh, like minds that was used in forming the current like uh, a structure of a corporation. The big time economist Peter Drucker was mentioned in this article. He's here. So this is from Time Magazine in 1953, December 28. When Dominican Father Felix Morlean first visited the U.S. in 1941, he did not think he would like it one bit. But to his own surprise, Burley, six foot one, two hundred forty pounds, Father Morlean, who escaped from Belgium when the Germans took over, found himself enchanted. He began using such phrases as "quote shoot the works," learned to count his calories, and started studying U.S. political history. 
gradually came to the conclusion that whereas, quote, this is an interesting quote here because of how involved the Jesuits were in the revolution, uh, American revolution, but continuing uh, for more than, quote, democracy is no philosophy in Europe. Americans have more philosophy than they know. Um, we must do on a world basis what the founding fathers did in the U.S. Do this, we must study and then make a quiet revolution, unquote. It's continuing. Um, last week in a four-story building in Rome, Father Morlian's revolution was going on a space under the name of International of the International University of Social Studies, generally known by its motto, Pro Dio. To many an Italian ac academician, it is a shocking place that bears no resemblance to a regular university at all. Nevertheless, Pro Dio has been growing at a rapid rate. In 1945, it had 80 students. Today, it has a faculty of 90 and enrollment of 1,000. There's a photo of Morion in this article here. I'll show you that, too. The idea behind Pro Dio is to combine a thorough background in Christian philosophy with training what Father Morion calls, quote, new social professions, journalism, the movies, business, administration, and labor relations. By concentrating on these, Father Morlian thinks the university will be influencing the most active managers and molders of the future. As undergraduate students move on from philosophy to economics, labor, and political science can later specialize in their chosen careers. Their work is anything but orthodox. I repeat, their work is anything but orthodox. <laughs> Cinema students actually help. Okay, so let me see. So here's a photo of Morlian from Time Magazine. And they, what do they say? Too many scholars, too few philosophers. <laughs> oh my God! This guy would, as of this guy, he's, you know, like a philosopher. Oh, what a joke. Okay, um, but you see here. So the cinema students actually help. Let's see here. Shoot Italian films. Journalists work at Legimen for Rome Report uh, for Rome reporters. One of the few universities that still has no government subsidy, Pro Dio is still able to afford such lecturers as Roberto Rossellini, interesting connection there, and U.S. economist Peter Drucker. Students from 26 countries have studied there and have gifts have come in from the far-flung sources as the family of the late Czech industrialist, Nazi sympathizer Thomas Bata, and U.S. Cardinal Spellman and Sturch. Last week, Father Morlian was making plans for a new Institute of European Studies. The man stated to take charge of it on a part-time basis, Alcide de Gasperi. And Gasperi was actually like a full-on uh, member of Pro Deo. To some critics, Pro Deo seems to be experiment so fast that it cannot do anything well, but Father Morlian, 49, intends to go on experimenting. We are, says he, a baby university, barely at the age of reason, but in Rome, if you can establish something and keep it going for seven or eight years, it will last forever. End quote. Um, and actually, I'll show you the. Uh, I'll show you the, like uh, here's from uh, the the Pro Dio pamphlet I had up earlier. You can see that Leo Gasperi is mentioned here as in the pamphlet as being a full on member of Pro Dio. Look, this is from the Pro Dio pamphlet. You see, like uh, this is what I showed you earlier in the video. You can see the photo of Morlian. Here's photos from inside a Pro Dio lecture class from the 50s. Some interesting photos in here. Um, let's see, here's the one of Morlian. I'm just going to show you that. There's Morlian right there where my mouse is. And there he is right here. Okay, but you see here, 1953, former Italian premier, and at least Gasperi was a Vatican Burry as well, and a Bilderberg member. But 1953, former Italian premier Alcide de Gasperi became the first director of Pro Dio's new Institute of European Studies. Training centers specialized in industrial uh, labor and public relations were set up in Milan and Turin for top executives, managers, and plant foremen. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? That's jokes. Like it's right in your face. Like this, this organization is, you know, this, this is a super intriguing organization, actually. You know, I'm going to show you, um, like, who is a member of the American subsidiary of Prodeo, and I'll probably wrap it up after that. But that'll get you a really good um, idea of how powerful this group was. So I'm just, so I'm going to read the uh, the Morlands. This was, I'm just going to read the le Morlands letter to uh, back and forth from him and Great and Upton. So this letter was dated April 11th. I'm going to show you the source after this, too. The letter is from Great Upton, Executive Vice President of the Bank, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, to Walter Rostow, a special economic assistant to the Jesuit educated at Georgetown, U.S. President Lyndon Johnson. 
Subject being on the letters revealing itself, titled Father Marlene and Program of Catholic Church for Indoctrination of Latin American Priests and Divulgation of Principles of U.S. Free Enterprise System. Parts of Graydon Upton's letter to Walter Rostow include, quote, you will recollect the, the you will recollect the lunch here at the bank a few weeks ago with Father Morlian. I now enclose a description of what he is doing. I personally consider this matter of utmost importance to U.S. U.S. policymakers for Latin America, and ask you to give it a most serious study. I first met Father Morlian at the Carcass meeting at the CICYP last year. There he gave a short talk in which he said, in effect, that after a year or so of letting the priesthood in Latin America follow their own ideas with respect to economics and politics. The Pope had decided to make a major effort to indoctrinate them in the concepts of the free enterprise system and to assist that they take an active role in teaching these concepts. The chief mechanism for this is the International University for Social Studies Pro Dio in Rome, which I understand must in the future be attended by any Latin American priest before he rises to a higher level in the Catholic hierarchy. In addition, various social directives which would be issued to the church, uh, which would be issued to the church in Latin America. Um, continuing, um, in effect, what Father Molina now wishes, and this is from Grayton Upton, the banker, writing this, in effect, what Father Molina now wishes to obtain is the following, quote, one, a serious review and of orientation in this whole effort by the U.S. government. I understand that Ambassador Reinhardt is well informed on the matter. Two, the strong moral backing of the U.S. government in discreet fashion of this effort. In this respect, as a first step, he wants to arrange a lunch and with you and with you both and hopefully Lincoln Gordon would be present with as many of the U.S. directors as possible where you would indicate the moral support of the U.S. government for this effort, for that effort to indoctrinate Latin American priests in the crony capitalism, continuing, a support which would hopefully contribute to and towards substantial private contributions from U.S. business, an investigation of the possibility of financial support for this effort by the U.S. government through an appropriate agency. Uh, and then the banker Graydon Upton notes, quote, for obvious reasons, efforts have been made to give no publicity to the program. It says, in conclusion, quote, P.S., I understand that commitments have already been received for contributions from businesses of $250 million and that Father Morlian expects this to be increased to $1 billion in the next few weeks. And then you see your Father Morlian sent a letter back to Graydon Upton five days before. He says here, dear friend, here at the second draft improved on the basis of your first suggestions. If you think the matter is sufficiently clear, you might send to Mr. Mann, Mr. Gordon, Mr. Rostad, photostats of this so they can tell you which day they could eventually meet with a few businessmen to conclude the first phase. How many phases of this program were there? Anyway, Mr. Hudermat or another assistant can eventually make some further improvements after phoning me. Before the middle of the next week, I hope to tell you that the first payments are made by some of the business leaders as approached. As you can imagine, the Rome authorities are waiting for my return at the end of the month to start preparation and practice. Look at this. Morlian writes to the banker, Great and Upton. I want to thank you again in the name of my high Roman friends for the inspiration you gave me in Carcris and the help you so uh, and the help so generously these days. We will need very much that you should repeat that your speech of Carcass in one of our Rome symposia, probably in the autumn. Totus to Prodeo Felix Morlian, President Prodeo University. And here's the source for this right here. You might think that, oh, like, there's no way that's a real letter. Well, you bet it is. You can see the documentation right here. <laughs> there's that. There's the RE, Father Morlian and Program of Catholic Church for Indoctrination of Latin American Priests and Divulgation and Principles of U.S. Free Enterprise System. You see, that's the exact, you see? This is the exact uh, letter I read to you. <laughs> And there's the there's the seal there's the heading on the bank Inter American Development Bank, and here's the letter that Morlian sent, right there, April sixth. Yes, but this this is what I want to show you here. So this is see, this is this is a document that Morlian sent from this is a more this is Morlian's American. Um, it was abbreviated the CIP, but his Morlian's American. Uh, organization was called the American Council for the International Promotion of De Democracy Under God, and all you got listen. Like you see, you have Thomas Bata as a director. You see right here. <laughs> um, yeah, Thomas Bata was listed. Uh, the Czech industrialist was um, listed on the Time Magazine article of 1953 of being very close to Felix Morland. <clears throat> Just look at some of these names. Like you see, your C.D. Jackson's on here. J. Peter Grace, the Knight of Malta. J. Peter Grace literally brought a high-level Nazi 
Otto Ambrose to join the board of the WR Grace Company. It was J. Peter Grace who also was the introductory speaker at the Knights of Malta dinner in 1989 when U.S. President Ronald Reagan was made a Knight of Malta. Mr. R Ronald Reagan referred to J. Peter Grace as Mr. President. Here, James A. Farley is on this list. James A. Farley was uh, the, the head of the DNC in the 1940s. He got Roosevelt elected. Farley was also then the Postmaster General and became the CEO of Coca-Cola Export International, Knight of Malta. I have a quote in the Dollar in the Vatican Prepice I did from a book on the history of Coke where Farley was like touring the world, visiting all the dictators of the world. Um, just look at some of these names. You know, Malcolm Wilson, the late Jesuit governor of New York, or the Nelson Rockefeller's uh, lieutenant governor, and then took over the governorship, governorship when uh, Rockefeller became uh, Gerald Ford's vice president. Malcolm Wilson, right here, you see at the bottom, went to Fordham Prep, got his bachelor's from Fordham, uh, master's from Fordham, and doctorate from Fordham. <laughs> And was on the board of, board of directors, Fordham Finance Council, you know, the whole nine yards. He actually, Malcolm Wilson, you know, got Nelson Rockefeller elected. So he, Malcolm Wilson was connected to Morland's group here. You see, um, Edward J. Martola. That's, I know that's, where does that guy come up? Edward J. Martola was connected to Morland. So I recommend you look at, like, who is on Morland's uh, board of directors. See, this guy was the president of New York Pace University. Like, the Nor Marlian had a real big intelligence network going. We see here Martola went to Jesuit Regis High School and Jesuit Fordham. <laughs> He's the president of... Uh... Oh, look, he sought the counsel of Reverend Robert Gannon, the president of Fordham, who said that the FBI and Fordham are the same. See, that's in the book, The FBI and the Catholic Church by Steve Ross on page 45, I think. Look at that. So Edward J. Martola sought the counsel of Jesuit Robert Gannon, the Jesuit president of Fordham from 1936 to 49, and recalled being told that, quote, unless you turn your collar around, you'll never be president of Fordham, but you might at Pace. <laughs> and that's where he went to. He went. He's the president of Pace University for 24 years. <laughs> oh, what a joke. Okay, but look at this. But like, look at this list, though, guys. Like, I reckon, look, Frank M. Folsom. Look, right under James Farley, see this? Frank M. Folsom was a papal uh, chamberlain of the cape and sword. Frank Folsom was Jesuit trained at Fordham and Georgetown, was a Knight of Malta, Knight of the Holy Sepulcher. He was the chairman of the Radio Corporation of America. He was also at a high up position at Coca-Cola, a Bohemian Club member. Frank Folsom was stationed with SR-71 Teddy Hesberg at the International Atomic Energy Agency Committee. Folsom and Hesburgh were the U.S. Uh, diplom represent representatives to that organization. So, like, look at this. Like, you know, I could spend you could spend hours, you know, going through this list of like who's on this, uh, who's connected to Morlian's intelligence group. But I recommend you, you know, look at it. Um, let me see. Um, let's see. Let's see. It was Harold Smitty. This guy was a uh, 17th president of General Electric was connected to Morley in the group. <laughs> General Electric's current CEO. Uh, oh, what was his first name? Um, and, oh, uh, it's in the dollar in the Vatican preface. Uh, let me pull this up. Give me a second here. I'm going to grab my book. We see Harold Francis, Harold Francis Smitty. So this guy's definitely a Catholic. He went to MIT, and this guy was the president of uh, General Electric, and he was connected to Morland's group. And, you know, General Electric, if you read, and this all ties in, you know, General Electric built the first hydroelectric dam in the Soviet Union. Read Anthony Sutton's great book, um, Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development, Radio Corporation of America, which papist Frank M. Folsom was the chair of, also, like, was hu huge in the Soviet Union. Um Yeah. I'm just pulling up with the my hard copy of the dollar in the Vatican. Give me a second. I forgot the CEO's name of uh 
General Electric. One second, the current CEO. Okay, it's John L. Flannery. Okay, so this you know it all ties together. So this Harold Francis Smitty was connected to uh, Morlian's Pro Deal. And this is the current guy at General Electric. This is what I wanted to find. John L. Flannery. He went to Jesuit Fairfield. And you, all you got to do is look at the 2017 General Electric Foundation report. And you'll see that General Electric gave over $3 million to the Catholic charities, organizations, uh, orphanages, um, and schools, Jesuit schools in particular. But uh, this guy went to Jesuit Fairfield, the current president of uh, GE. He also went to Northwest Catholic School. Uh, oh, he went to yeah, Fairfield right here. Oh, actually, he went to Wharton. He went to uh, the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business, too. Yeah, this guy's very plugged in. And then he succeeded Roman Catholic Jeffrey Emlet as uh, 11th CEO. <laughs> Jeffrey Emlet, Roman Catholic, 2010 Boston College, got an honorary doctorate of business administration. Be right there. <laughs> So, you know, it all ties in. But, yeah, I think that's all for this one, YouTube. You see, Father Felix Morlin, you know, is like a man. Like, uh, he was like a man in black. And actually, I'll show you this before I go. He was also very involved in the movie industry. Very so. He actually he comes up in the memoirs of Will H. Hayes, the first president of the motion pictures producers. See, Hayes talks about his trip to the Rome. He says, the most significant experience of the trip, especially in light of later events, were my visits with Cardinal Pacelli and Count Ghazali, which the later graciously arranged. Uh, and two pleasant social calls. Mrs. Hayes, I don't know if Mrs. Hayes was Catholic, probably was though, I'll have to look into that. Mrs. Hayes and I found the Cardinal most sympathetic and unsurprisingly well-informed about America. He spoke excellent English. Actually, you know what, you can see, uh, I sent this, if, um, yeah, I think I sent this video to the team, but uh, I, I got it got copyright flagged, but you can find a video of Pope Pius XII actually addressing allied soldiers in Rome in English. And he tells them that, like, uh, you need to look up to the heroes like Sir Thomas More, uh, a papal inquisitor who, like, murdered thousands of people as, like, a light. Uh, as, as a, you need to look up at Sir Thomas More as a luminary to protect your uh, Western civilization. It's pretty comical, but um, you hear the popes, uh, apparently Will Hayes spoke excellent English. He didn't speak excellent English to me. You could barely understand what he was saying. But I also had another visit of at least two hours during which he told me, quite frankly, the purpose of his visit to the United States. It had to do with the pro deal movement. So, this is coming from Will Hayes. So like the, the purpose of Pope Pacelli's visit to the U.S. in 36, where he stayed at the uh, the mansion, the Innisfada mansion of um, Nicholas Frederick Brady's wife, uh, the Duchess Brady, who the, the Innisfada mansion the next year was given to the Jesuits in its entirety. But uh, you see, Pius went to uh, the, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, according to Will Hayes, that Pius went to the U.S. was to deal with the pro deal movement. Yeah. <laughs> um, you see here, I'm not going to read all of it. Hayes continues, the Holy Father went uh, once into the pro deal movement, of which Cardinal Pacelli had given me some account on our trip over. I was again impressed by the unity in the world sweep of the organized idea. <laughs> um, and actually interesting here, the Pope, uh, apparently the Pope told Will Hayes, to quote, and this is like this is to be Pope Pius XI. Pope Pius XI told Will Hayes to go out and get hold of the cinema of the world. End quote. This is when Hayes was chairman of the uh, motion pictures distributors, and you know Hayes was Hayes was uh, serving the Pope, and that's why they named the code that was written by the Jesuit Daniel A. Lord uh, the Hayes Code. Uh, but you see your point. So this is from from the book here, Routledge Advances in Film Studies by Daniela. Trevelli. This book's called um, um, Post-War Italian Cinema, American Intervention, Vatican Interests. We see here in an article published in 1954 in uh, Cinematographo, um, the official Catholic film journal published by the Central Catholico Cinematographico. And this, this, this is right from Felix Morley is referred to as a Jesuit. The Belgian Jesuit Felix A. Morlian clarified the Catholic awareness of the power of cinema and its obligations to fight against communists in the film industry. And you see, that's kind of, that's all like a mirage too, because you see, I showed in the early part of the video, Morlian was opening up to the Soviet communists in Russia to get closer relations between the Vatican and Moscow. And Morlian wanted to create like a world, a quote, a world citizen. Like, are you kidding? <laughs> 
Okay, but okay, Morley was heavily involved in Italian cinema in the post-war world. He contributed to the creation of the Cineform. Uh, he collaborated with filmmakers such as Roberto Rosalini. Rosalini was in the Time Magazine article I read. Uh, Mor his article from Mor Morleans will not only listed all communist simula initiatives such as the creation of the Cinegrab de Information, Information Cine Brigades, information groups which he had had the responsibility for strengthening the party by distributing audiovisual propaganda documents in large and small centers, but also highlighted the, the dissemination of Christian values throughout the medium of cinema. As he, as he Morlean stated, Christians have become aware of the exceptional psychological power of the film in attracting the masses. Very interesting quote. Replace that, you know, Christians by Catholics. But, you know, um, <laughs> Morlean's, you know, bragging about knowing about the extreme psychological power of film in attracting the masses. Um, <laughs> very revealing. And let me see here. I think this was actually in this batch of documents. I mentioned how Morlean was writing to you, Thant. I'm just going to show you because you thant um, is that because I mentioned in the Norman Cousins book I read here, or the critical world medicine. You see, Morlean's his philosophical outlook was that of a world citizen. That's Felix Morlean. That's what Norman Cousins said. But I just want to see he Morlean was actually you know writing to the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. And this is at the same time, you know, he's close with, like, the P2 Masons as well, and the Russians. And this is the C he was a CIA agent admitted by Robert Graham, the Jesuit. <laughs> so his Morlean character is very, very interesting. But he sent a letter to you, Thant. Yeah, so here's Deputy General of the United Nations. Dear Father, Mr. Dear Mr. Morley, and the Secretary General Uthan has asked me to reply to your kind letter of February twentieth, nineteen sixty-three, concerning the Ninth Brotherhood Banquet, which will be held at the Plaza on Monday, first, nineteen sixty-three. Yeah, and actually, Nelson Rockefeller went to this banquet. That and guess who was the leader of the banquet? None other than the Jesuit priest Augustine Bay, S.J. <laughs> um, and here, here's Felix Morley on writing to Uthan. You see, here's the February twentieth letter. I'll read this in full. To you, Thant, Secretary General of the United Nations, Your Excellency, I have communicated to His Eminence Cardinal Bay, a Jesuit, to the other Roman authorities, as well as our American Council, your wonderfully kind and spontaneous acceptance of our invitation to speak at the Ninth Brotherhood Banquet, uh, Agape, which will be held at the Plaza on Monday, April 1st. Even before you receive formal clarification from the Chairman and President of the Council, I want to thank you again in name of all of us for your active participation. This is Felix Morley on writing this. I will not fail to bring you personally to the text of his eminence and explain also the comments which speakers of other continents and other religious groups will present at the meeting to strengthen our common human uh, denominates. Your sincerely yours, Felix Morley. <laughs> so he was in, he was, you know, regular, like here's, a, there's an, um, actually, and this is crazy. This is another, this is a letter I found uh, from the New York Times. I'm out of my free articles, but you can read the obituary of this John P. E. Brown here, who is connected to uh, Morland's board of directors list here on the left. But this John P. E. Brown was like a Knight of Columbus and like a Knight of Malta, and he was like a, 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 a powerful insurance man in uh, New York City. He says here, speaking to you, Than, we are glad to learn through Father Felix Morland of your acceptance of our invitation to speak at the first American Agape meeting. <laughs> right there. He, and look, he, he's sending you Thant in advance, in advance, Cardinal Bay's full text. This is another thing from reading this book here, um, The Improbable Triumphant. I found that uh, Cousins said that Pope John Paul the 20, Pope John Twenty Third, sent Nikita Khrushchev in advance of his papal bulls before he would publish them. You know, which I thought which was interesting. Um, but, you know, this John P. E. Brown, and you look, J. Peter Grace was chaired in this, or was attached in this message as well with Henry Luce and Paul Felix Warburg. Paul Felix, what's a, you know, a Jew like Paul Felix Warburg doing in this Catholic organization while well, he's kissing the ring of the Pope as a papal court Jew? Um, you, know, you can read this. Uh, they released a document called The Power of an Idea. There's some interesting, you know, documents in this batch that I found. But here is the here is the dinner here is youth Thant's statement at this dinner of the uh, nine um, what was it the dinner of the nine something 
Let me just get this. Uh, yeah, the Ninth Brotherhood Banquet. Okay, there's the Ninth Brotherhood Banquet. Okay, but here's Youth Ant's uh, speech at the Ninth Brotherhood Banquet. And look, Nelson Rockefeller's there. Look, N Governor Rockefeller, your excellencies. <laughs> So, you know, Nelson Rockefeller was doubtlessly close to, you know, Mal or he was close to Malcolm Wilson. Malcolm Wilson was on the board of Morleyan's uh, inter organization. Um, let me see here. Actually, this, was for, this, this is actually just another interesting connection quick here. That if you look at the Safari group, Morleyan was doubtlessly close to the Safari group because that French Knight of Malta, Count Mar Marinchens, who is Reagan's, uh, Alexandre de Marinchens here, was very involved in the Safari Group. The Safari Group was supposedly created by uh, Henry Kissinger. But Kissinger was a professor at uh, Jesuit Georgetown University. But a former Saudi intelligence chief, Prince Turki bin Fazel al Saud, who is the who went to Jesuit Georgetown, who he was the guy who resigned ten days before 9/11 as the head of Saudi's intelligence. He told the Safari Club that in 1946, after Watergate, Watergate matters took place here, your intelligence community was literally tied up by Congress. It could do not. It could not do anything. It could not send spies, it could not write reports, it could not pay money. In order to compensate for that, a group of countries got together in hope of fighting communism and help establish what was called the Safari Club. Uh, included France, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and uh, Iran. So it's interesting, though, that this <laughs> Jesuit-educated Saudi intelligence chief uh, told Georgetown University alumni this about uh, the Safari Club. Very interesting. Um, Here's another letter to a youth aunt. Look, <laughs> in his reference to our conversation that I'm sending here with, this is from Morley the English text of the opening prayer, which be offered by his eminence, Cardinal Francis Spellman. It was all ties in. Cardinal Francis Spellman gave Frank M. Folsom here the Lattery Medal in 1958. Here's Spellman for the common purpose, as he has as become the tradition in the interreligious civic agapes of Prodeo. You know, I'm just going to wrap this up here. There's an interesting accusation just in the declassified letters uh, that you can get from C.D. Jackson to Henry Luce on Prodeo. It's, this is what C.D. Jackson says here, though. He says he was talking, Morlin was talking to John Price Jones, and I looked at this John Price Jones guy like would raise billions of, he would really raise billions of dollars with fundraising. But this is what C.D. Jackson said. Morlin has been also talking to John Price Jones. When I explained to him that these fundraising organizations did not actually solicit money themselves, but acted as professional secretariat for the appropriate individuals, Morlean assured me that this was different and that they had an individual who had, quote, done the work for Fordham. I'll find out more about this. And that you know, I, I'd say the one who'd done the work for Fordham was most likely Cardinal Francis Spellman. Could have also been uh, Robert Ignatius Gannon, S.J. Spellman's superior. Um, and here's the accusation from uh, Covert Action Information Bulletin. Um, here, the Romanian temple alleged that, quote, in 1946, the Pope entrusted the, the Dominican friar Felix A. Morley and the Belgian with the reorganization of that, the Vatican Intelligence Service and its merger with the Jesuit espionage network, end quote. Um, and here's another just source here you can read in an article I put here called The Pro Deal Movement by Anna Brady. This article is in like a bigger book. But um, the 1942 article, and Anna Brady, I posit, could have been, you know, related to Nicholas Frederick Brady. It says Anna Brady is bragging about here in 1942 that, quote, in the preparation and presentation of this material, such notable authorities as Mr. Paul Anderson, uh, Adolf Burley Jr. This is interesting here. Adolf Burley Jr. Um, was the U.S. ambassador to Brazil who was involved in many coups in South America. And he's Burley is also mentioned in the memoirs that you can read on my archive.org page of the Jesuit Joseph Rettinger who, that Rettinger really liked Adolf Burley. <laughs> I'll just say that. Uh, anybody, anybody, Father Wilfred Parsons S.J. has participated in uh, Pro Deo. Um, you see, one of the important parts of this work is the, the allowed practical cooperation between Catholics and non-Catholics. This is the merging between the Catholic and the non-Catholic elite business community. That's what that is. With the aim of making religious motives the strongest force in public life. Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, they get, and I'm just going to wrap it up here with um, this new Louise University that's having TED Talks there re frequently and bragging about how many prominent diplomats that they uh, graduate. The Umberto Agnelli, the brother of Giannini Agnelli of Fiat, is seen here. Giannini Agnelli, one of the founders of Louise, the school that Prodeo merged into. Morlin was the first president of Louise. Uh, here's Agnelli seen with Jesuit-trained Knight of Malta, Alexander Haig. Um, and it, 
LaRouche claims here that Agnelli is a Club of Rome associate. But it's kind of funny that this photo is in this article because this article is literally called The Jesuits Charge That LaRouche is an Agent of the Vatican. Um, <laughs> and that, that the Alexander, yeah, it says, fellow Jesuits of U.S. Secretary Alexander Haig are presently circulating the astonishing accusation that LaRouche and his publications are, quote, agents of the Vatican. LaRouche is an agent of the Vatican. <laughs> That's funny that they uh, put that out in plain sight. But uh, yeah, I think that's all. Let me see if anyone's in the uh, chat here. I'll get the photo of Morley and up while I'm. Uh... Well, I do gotta get going. My getting some calls. Give me a second. Hey, what's up, guys? Um, no, definitely. Def Rome definitely has hijacked uh, Christianity. Who's? Oh, they, they, there's no, there's no comparison. The Jesuits are infinitely more of a threat than the the Jews. Infinitely more of a threat. You know, a supposed Jew, Michael Shertoff, who uh, was the director of Homeland Security. His wife is a professor at Jesuit Georgetown University, and the Jew, Michael Shertoff, at the Brussels. Forum in 2008 was, you know, um, lamishing being able to see the tomb of St. John Paul uh, the Great. Um, you know, Janet Yellen is a Jew that was the head of the Federal Reserve recently. Had a husband, Daniel Akarov, that's a professor at Jesuit Georgetown University. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a Jew on the Supreme Court, had a husband, Martin Ginsburg, who is a professor at Jesuit Georgetown University. You know, all these Jews kiss the ring um, when you begin to look into it. Um, yeah, guys, I got to get going, though. Absolutely, Jeremy, the Jesuits control the CIA. Uh, everyone should check out the clip of E. Howard Hunt, the former CIA official, who said that the Jesuits form the greatest intelligence service in the world and always have. And the Jesuit Robert Graham confirmed that Father Felix Morley in here was uh, working for the CIA. Um, more proof, ultimately, the CIA and the KGB are working together. Morlean was sent as the intermediary to mer uh, merge the relations between the United States, the Vatican, and Moscow in the 60s, as I covered in the first part of the video. Yeah, that's all for this one, YouTube. I do got to get going. Peace and love, and uh, Namnast. I'll catch you on the next one.